Hey, what's up everybody? This is Hotch Nazi, and today I want to talk about antenna tuners, specifically one antenna tuner. But before we get into that, I want to talk about a philosophical discussion topic that is antenna tuners. Not too long ago in the ham radio crash course, I was invited to go to another ham radio board to look at one of their posts regarding antenna tuners. And somebody asked a very simple question, do I need an antenna tuner? And this person got a, I'd say, 60-40 mix of people, 60% saying no, and they, you know, push up the, the, the bridge of their glasses. No, you do not, because if your antenna is tuned or cut appropriately, you do not need an antenna tuner. Uh, the reality is, is that's not totally true. Even when you have your antenna cut specifically to a frequency, take the Jerry Dipole, for example. Um, it's only going to be broadband enough for a specific frequency through most of it. Um, as you get to the ends though, that SWR begins to climb and that's when a tuner would be used to bring that down to a workable level. Now, don't get me wrong, if an antenna goes from 1.5 SWR to 2, point, uh, 2 to 1 SWR, it's not that big a deal. But there are other reasons why you'd want a tuner. So let's say for the longest time you've been using a perfectly matched 20 meter dipole and you get that bug, you get that burning desire to maybe experiment a little bit. You start thinking about getting into a hot little end-fed number or maybe a crazy off-center dipole or something traditional and classy like a doublet. Well, all of those antennas require a tuner because they're not specifically resonant on any one frequency. That means that when your radio tunes to a specific frequency, the tuner is going to help you match the power that's coming out of your antenna to the antenna. Um, sorry, the other way around. The, antenna, the tuner is going to help match the power coming out of the radio, your transmitter, to your antenna. Or take my example, I have a much maligned G5 RV on my roof, um, and so a tuner for that is pretty much required. Now, most people will say, well, just use the internal tuner on your radio. Well, that's not also going to work for things like half-wave end-feds, even some of the off-center dipoles, and my G5 RV. They can go above 3 to 1 on, um, on the SWR, which means the antenna tuners for most 100-watt radios will not cover it and thus you need an antenna tuner. Now, fear not, you're not committing some cardinal sin in ham radio by giving up and going with a tuner. Far from it, it just means that you're trying to get um, every bit of RF out as you can because the best thing you can possibly have in your station is an antenna on up in the air and a radio connected to it. Fear not, tuners are fine, and there's specifically very good reasons why you may want a tuner. So with all that out of the way, the tuner I picked up was the MFJ993B with an ICOM interface cable so that I'll be able to take my 7300 and connect it to it. The power is provided from the 7300 to the tuner and it uh, automatically will pick up and tune whenever I begin to transmit with my ICOM. Now walking around this tuner, you have two coax connector locations for antenna one and antenna two. You have a balanced line input and you have just a long wire input. And there's also uh, grounding for bonding as well. Now, that's, that's great. Um, you also have the connection for interfacing with the radio. It gives you lots of options for experimentation, not just playing with coax fed, but the balance line feed too. Very cool. There's three trademark technologies that goes into this tuner. There's instant recall, IntelliTune, and adapt search. Well, what does that mean? It's an algorithm that gives you fast automatic tuning with more than 20,000 non-volatile virtual antenna memories. So basically, when you have the antennas connected, there is a memory bank, and each bank has over 2,500 non-volatile memories for tuner settings. So what that means is basically you're going to connect your antenna to the tuner. When you begin to transmit, the antenna tuner, using its onboard memory, is going to remember the final SWR and the tuning pattern that your radio requires for that antenna on that frequency. That's awesome. And it does that every time you tune up on a new frequency, regardless of what you're doing, it just kind of takes over and automatically does it. So there's varying degrees of quickness, right? Because if you've already been to it and it already has the stored memory, boom, it's in there very quickly. I've noticed this all the time when I use FT8. It's just 
it hits it and we're done. Doesn't matter if I'm 20, 40, 80 meters, it just handles it. Now, if it has to start going through and figuring out how things work, then it starts to dip into these other trademark technology algorithms to factor and figure out the final solution for SWR. Instant Recall checks its memory to see if you have operated on that frequency before. If so, tuning is instantaneous and you're ready to operate, meaning what I mentioned before, if it's in its memory banks, boom, it switches it over, you're good to go. It measures the complex appearance of your antenna, next it calculates the components it needs and instantly snaps them in. Finally, it fine tunes to minimize SWR and you're ready to operate, typically in a fraction of a second. And again, mentioning FT8, it's generally true in my experience. If the antenna impedance is not within the tuner's measured range, MFJ's adaptive search algorithm goes into action, frequency is measured, and relevant component values are determined. This tuner tunes between one and two SWR, default is 1.5, lands right in the middle. Now, it's rated for 300 watt output from your radio. Now, what that gives you, okay, now, now you get varying degrees of effectiveness depending on how much power you put out. 300 watt capability, this tuner can take 32 to 1 SWR and set it and get it down to 1.5 or, or around 2, right? Somewhere between 1 and 2. However, if you are transmitting at 150 watts and less, it will do 64 to 1. So I jokingly said, I think on Twitter or Instagram, that this thing could tune a lawn chair and I'm pretty confident that if you're below 150 uh, SWR, it probably can. So going around the front of the tuner, you see a couple of things. There's a standard needle SWR meter that gives you obviously your SWR and your reflected power. There's also an LCD screen that has uh, multi-mode functions that you can display. You can display output power and reflected power, which for me is really nice because I can see what I'm driving out to the antenna and that allows me usually for FT8 to kind of bring my power down or understand where I'm at based off of the propagation in that day on the given bands that I'm using to determine how much power I want to use to attempt to make those contacts. Important to note too as well, along with all the other capabilities and functionalities built into the tuner, it also has a four to one Ballon that is used for when you connect to balanced lines. So you could theoretically connect a G5RV directly to those terminal posts at the back and use that um, and, and go immediately out on the antenna. And in fact, you'd probably do pretty well because it connects directly from the feed line to the tuner, to the radio. So as a practical example, let's go back to the bench and see if we can go to some random frequencies and how fast we can tune. Okay, tuners in the bottom here. Uh, I do need to mention that this backlight is really, really bright and it's blowing out the fine markings on the SWR meter. But trust me, it's like a standard SWR power meter that you would expect to see. The LCD's bright, really nice. We're on 14.76, um, obviously we're on 14.74, but the memory bank's good enough. That memory location is good enough to get to a 1.4 SWR at 60 right now, 60 watts. We're gonna turn that down to 35 watts. And we'll go to, uh, let's go to 30 meters. Okay, so now we're on 30 meters using WSJTX on FT8. And I'll go ahead and enable CQ here. And we should see right down here change very quickly when it begins transmitting. Should begin right now. And there we go. Dropped it down to a 1 to 1 match at 10 point one three eight so it found a solution really fast awesome so this is the time with all my reviews where I say some of the things I don't like about the product two things uh, it's a little big but at the same time, when you factor in what it has, onboard memory, oh, a four to one Ballon, and then obviously the L matching networks and, and all that, um, it's not to be that unexpected. You've got the LCD screen, you've got the SWR meter. So I'm not an apologist for it, but uh, at the same time, it's kind of not that surprising. And it doesn't take up that much space on your desk. You probably fit it into a little, I'm building something right now that'll kind of enc encase everything. So I'm not that worried about it. It sticks out a little bit more than I wanted, but for you, that's probably not a big deal. Uh, number two, 
So MFJ sometimes has quality control issues with uh, some of their cases, some of the metal boxes that go on the unit. And in this case, this one has uh, the whole, the holes don't line up between the case, the, the sides of the case. So one screw is kind of not dialed in all the way. It's kind of indicative of what you can expect sometimes with MFJ. The product itself works perfectly, works amazing. Just some of the fit and finish is not completely there. Now, I'm just gonna take a screwdriver and see if I can just gun it all the way in there a little bit more, but yeah, no big deal. Now, I do wanna point out, now this is not really a case for that, but MFJ has a very strong warranty and if you tinker on the product to try and fix it without before making a warranty claim, they will not void the warranty, which is really nice. I think you should still contact them before you go off the, the path a little bit and start working on it. But it's good to know that they're supportive in, in helping you out in case there is a problem and they don't mind you experimenting. This is ham radio after all, and that's a good thing. So it's been a couple of weeks with the 993 and I'm very happy with it. I find that it is it makes the whole operation of the radio much easier. It's a little bit more transparent. I like that it's kind of just powered up and go. You do have to get the interface cable for your radio. It can work without it, but you get a little bit more transparency or, or um, automation when you have that cable. So I'd say, go spend the extra money and get that interface cable. The links are going to be in the description to find the tuner and where you can pick it up. I'm a big fan of, of, the, of the actual product, of how it functions and how it's been working for me. It's been great on FT8, it's been very good on CW. And the single sideband stuff, I can't blame the tuner for that. I think that's more to do with the propagation and my antenna. They're just they're just not they're just not jiving together. So in the future, I think I'm gonna be looking at another little bit higher dollar antenna, maybe something with a little directionality and a little bit of gain. So look forward to more of those videos upcoming as we go through field day preparations and getting ready for some shack upgrades. Anyway, guys, if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you have not already, please hit subscribe and make sure you hit that ding ling bell because every Friday at 7 p.m. we are live for the Ham Radio Crash Course as we move farther in learning more together about ham radio. There's a Ham Radio Crash Course Facebook group which I urge you to check out. We have a Discord as well. More information is on the Facebook page. There is a newsletter that I put out every month. One dollar gets you access to the newsletter through Patreon. The links for all this are in the description. I hope you do check it out. Please let me know what you thought in the comments and I'll talk to you later.